Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Take Your Life Back Summit. Our mission really in this summit is we want to help people to feel hope, find answers, and ultimately start healing. We are exploring over 21 experts' roadmaps out of chronic pain, fatigue, and autoimmune disorder. And today's expert is Rick Bramos. He has more than 35 years of experience as a fitness coach, including time as a trainer for the U.S. Army. He is developer of the Two Days to Fitness program that brings a scientific approach to weight loss, cardiovascular conditioning, and muscle strengthening. His work on how foods affect hormones has been published in a national magazine. Rick is also the co-founder of Two Days to Fitness, a book that addresses biochemical glitches that can slow metabolism and impede weight loss. In addition to being a former bodybuilder and powerlifter, he is a certified aerobics, cycling, and body pump instructor. He also has a background in biochemistry and functional medicine. Wow, you keep busy, Rick. Welcome Thanks. to the summit. I'm Thanks excited to have you here. The diversity is what helps me help you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I do want to dive in because I think your message is really powerful. And you, I have a lot of things I want to review with you in the short time we have sure. together. But I'm, I also, I, I looked at all your stuff and as getting to know you and even looking through your website and your book, you're pretty passionate about what you do and really have a drive to serve people. Where does that come from? How did you end up where you are? Well, I've always been in the fitness game, as you just mentioned, my bio. I've been a, a diverse in the fitness field as a coach in the Army, working with people. And then most competitive, I, was, I owned the first gold gym in South Carolina. I was very competitive, powerlifting, bodybuilding. But then I really turned my uh, outlook onto aerobics and helping people that really needed me, the overweight uh, uh, people. Uh, it's the largest niche market in America. So in my late 30s and early 40s, I turned to aerobics because I thought that was the answer to the obese market. They helped them lose weight. Because at the time, we all thought the simple formula of reduce calories and add exercise will work. Well, I know now that doesn't work. And that's my drive right now is that there's so much misinformation out there right now that people are confused and frustrated with the results they're getting. And I'm back to writing a book right now, my second one called 10,000 Steps to Nowhere, Counterintuitive Solutions to Fitness and Weight Loss, because we're really being misled by the government on the uh, dietary side of it, you know, because of the special inter interest groups on what they want to sell us as opposed to what's good for us. And even on the exercise side, we'll talk a little bit about it, that we're really getting the wrong message on what works because Believe it or not, exercise, and you've probably seen the studies in the past, most people aren't seeing, studies show that exercise is not very effective at helping people lose weight. And with this diverse background, this experience I've had, I've found that to be true. Thousands and thousands of people I worked with in aerobics and that, and they weren't getting the results. So that got me motivated now, especially at my age now, to give back and show them what really works or demonstrate at least. So you're really driven by a results approach for people, knowing where you came from, really, what you've, you've tried a little bit of everything. Well, I've tried a little bit of everything to see what works, and, and I've yeah. taken all that background, and that's what this two days to fitness is derived from, this experience, what really works for people. So when it comes to exercise, you said what we believe to be true really isn't. Is, do, what you mean is that people feel like they have to exercise more to lose weight. What's your message to them? The fact is, exercise is not very effective at helping people lose weight. Now, let me qualify that based on the fact that most people that aren't are athletes are just going to the gym, what, for an hour, maybe a few days a week. So they're misled and thinking, well, I've gone to the gym, I've exercised a few days a week, but that's just one hour out of the day. And I make a point to all my clients that if they do not change the way they eat, outside the biochemical glitches of the body, such as thyroid and that, if they're not changing their eating, they're not going to lose weight. I've worked with thousands of people, and that's why most people at health clubs are frustrated. They go to the gym, they set up exercise, but it just doesn't work. So we're being misled that a calorie in and calorie out works, and it just doesn't because, as you know, hormones and enzymes dictate how we use food. And how I address that for the common person is simply this. Everyone knows intuitively that 500 calories of donuts and uh, Pop-Tarts and ice cream and cereal is not the same as 500 calories of a steak and salad. They may not understand the hormonal side, but there is a difference. And that's why calories in and calories out doesn't work. And I explain that to them thoroughly. 
Yeah, agreed, agreed. Can you expand a little bit on that? Just because I think the average person listening might, might think, yes, I understand a donut's not a salad and you'll get more bulk volume with a salad than a donut, but most people don't understand, I don't think, or really know how to put those pieces together with how does the body process that and why is it processed differently? Is there any way that you could simplistically break that down for us? I think simply it comes down to which again, you know, the hormone insulin. Most, most people still don't understand that. Every time they eat, insulin helps digest the food and stores the excess calories. And of course, if it's sugar and carbohydrate calories and there's too many of them, the body can only store so much energy in the muscles and the rest has to be stored as fat. So here's the problem. Too many people are eating too many snacks, too much food, too much of the wrong food, and insulin causes that excess calories to be stored as fat. But here's the, here's the kicker. If they're eating all the time, all throughout the day, now, now let me make a, qualify that. Someone, some of my bariatric patients and clients that have to eat small meals all throughout the day, I understand that. But if they're eating the wrong food and they're eating sugar, even if it's, here's the misleading on TV, it's only a 100-calorie snack. But if that 100 calories is one of those fudge brownies and they say it's only 100 calories, they're constantly stimulating insulin all throughout the day. So now I don't care how much they exercise, insulin keeps the body from accessing fat stores or the fatty acids for energy. So that's the kicker. They don't get it. If they don't change their eating, the exercise can't even get at the fatty acids to use for energy. So now they're frustrated and they're actually hungry more because some of that food they're eating is getting stored in a... In a in a cabinet and they don't realize they can't get it. So all the exercise in the world. Now I'll qualify that one more time for my clients always do. The typical person trains and goes to the gym for an hour, two, three, four, five times a week. And that's why they're frustrated. Now, if you take an athlete, yes, if they're training three, four hours a day, burning mega calories, that's the only case where they may compensate for excessive calories. But the average person is not going to lose weight, body fat, by just exercising alone. So you're saying, or is it true, that really if you're eating the right foods, there's no need to calorie count? There's no need to calorie count in most cases, I agree. I like, first I make the point that it's more about what you eat than how much you eat. And then I go to, in most cases, most Americans are still eating too much. Remember, they're, they're going to the gym for one hour, then they're going to their office sitting for the rest of the day, they're not active, and then they go out to lunch and have 1200 calorie lunch and they don't understand that one hour of exercise will not compensate especially if the food is the too much of the carbohydrates and sugar side of it right i like that you said we go to the gym for an hour expecting that to really affect the other 23 hours of the day so the question would be as as we're looking at dietary changes could you give us a basic overview of what should we be eating well i'm going to simplify because i, I believe any type of good quality uh food if you're whether you're vegan or not you can eat right if, if you look it up and take your time to invest in what's good protein source especially for a vegan but the key is the biggest culprit today simplify is the sugar drinks and people don't get it that doesn't mean just the sodas that means the sports drinks are high fructose corn syrup and the juice is all bad we don't we didn't eat like this when i was younger we ate whole fruits the fruit juices the sports drinks are misleading people that's the biggest culprit right there. That's the largest amount of the calories. And again, then they think they're going to exercise and they can work that off and they can't. Because high fructose corn syrup, which you know is the worst of the sugars, there's a new book coming out on it, has to be processed by the liver. The liver can only handle so much of that workload and stores, I think 30, 40% of it is fat right away. So the high fructose corn syrup is the worst. Not only that, the ravages of glycation on the body, which you're probably familiar with, breaking down collagen in the body. People don't understand. The sugars don't just make us fat. It's, it's the initiation of a lot of disease. Uh, the collagens in our eyes, our renal, all over the body, which you know. So food, it really, we have to realize as consumers is so much more than just being at the proper weight. It's feeding food. our body fuel. Food is the key to being healthy. And then the right kind of exercise can be an adjunct to this eating, meaning, and this is what I'm writing this book about. If I am going to exercise, here's the next big misleading by our whole healthcare system. This uh, recommendation to low intensity, long duration type activity, which is aerobics. If you have limited time, which most people do, and that's what I address in this book, most of the Americans don't have the time. The overweight Americans say that's the number one issue is time. So, 
I, I ask my clients a question. If you only have two times a week to train, and you only have two hours, which would you do? I'm going to put it in perspective, which type of exercise is most important. And I've asked doctors, and they've actually had their trainers on line with me like we're doing right now. And I've asked the trainer, said, if you only have two hours of a client, you know that's all they're ever going to do. What are you going to do? An hour of walking on that treadmill twice a week, or would you do resistance training? Now, resistance training is the way to go. This is what my book's all about. I'm a 180 from everything you hear out there. Strength as a base gives us more bang for our buck, especially as we get older and seniors. We need strength. Muscle, as you know, is a marker of aging. Muscle also correlates, a lot of people don't know, with aging population with bone density and bone strength. And walking doesn't do that. They've done plenty of studies on that. Strength training improves the, uh, increases the amount of muscle mass. Muscle is where sugars and fats are metabolized. So if you go to the gym and just do a lot of light stuff, and because you're so out of shape, most Americans, that's stamina building, but the post-metabolic burn isn't big either. So resistance training gives you more bang for your buck. It strengthens you. It increases the integrity of our joints. And most Americans, I'm dealing with people that have shoulder injuries, rotator cuff, as you know, knee issues, hip issues, and that walk in the treadmill doesn't address this issue, and it's not effective, especially if you have limited time. It doesn't address the issue of accessing the fat stores for energy. So weight training is the big difference that I teach over low-intensity cardiovascular exercise. Which is what you mean by post-metabolic burn. You're saying that... When we train heavy with resistance training, and all you need to do is go to one set. I like two sets to failure. And heavy is a relative term, obviously, for somebody aging, younger, male or female. But if you take a set or two to failure, we stimulate what's called protein synthesis of the contractile fibers. It's just a fancy name for building more muscle. And it takes a lot of energy after the workout. That's called the post-metabolic burn. It can be up to 48 hours. Now the body, if we're only working out twice a week, now, if you're eating right and drinking water between meals, the body uh, uh, taps into those fat stores to recover from that kind of workout. If you and I go around like all these magazines just do these, I hate seeing, it's a shame that it's mostly women, five-pound dumbbells doing these little, what I call weenie exercises I put in my book. It doesn't <laughs> challenge the metabolism. Exercise, remember, exercise is an activity that is challenging enough or of sufficient effort that you stimulate an adapt adaptation by the body, whether it's strength or speed or endurance or stamina. So a lot of people are active, but it's, it's not enough. It's not enough to stimulate what I want, which is muscle. Muscle is the, is the base workout I teach everybody because you're gonna get more bang for your buck. So it's not necessarily just how much are you sweating in the gym through cardio. We have That's to true. That. This is true. See, a lot of people go into the gym, and I see this with trainers, and it's not their fault. This is what they're being taught. They'll take somebody new, overweight, bring them in the gym, and they run around like a chicken with his head cut off. Now, because these people are so out of shape, that's stamina. And they get out of breath fast, and they go out of the gym out of breath, but they haven't stimulated the metabolism with the largest muscles of the body. And that's what you really want to do. You want to stimulate the largest muscles of the body, especially if you're only going to train twice a week. And remember this, the average person is not, that's overweight is not playing a sport. So they don't need this high level of endurance. They need to start out with a base of strength. And what that does for overweight America allows me to slow them down in the workout in the beginning and build what I call a tolerance for exercise first, not only physiologically, but mentally too, so they can adapt a little bit to it, get to like it a little bit, believe it or not, and then they're more likely to stick with it. Oh, I agree. How many people do we hear say they hate exercising or they hate water? I think the point would be sometimes you just have to do what's right for your body, and part of that education is power. Knowledge is power. Um, I love that you said 48 hours sometimes for a post-metabolic burn. I don't know. For me, I didn't know that exact number, and, and that's motivating enough to get out there and, and get your workout in. Well, right. this, this helps you realize that you don't have to be in the gym every day. That's what I teach people. 
So that's sort of what I wanted to dive into and what really caught my eye when I started looking at your particular work. I, I personally am a half marathon long distance runner. Part of that is that you do run five or six times a week and you're running, um, you know, a long time each day. I too have been trained that the way you get in shape, stay in shape and keep your body healthy is cardiovascular exercise over multiple days. Now, as I am busy with children and getting older and realizing that uh, sometimes that's hard to keep up that level and still have energy the rest of the day, I love the idea that maybe what my body really needs is less time in the gym. So could you, could you expand upon that, how your program works and, and what it can do for the body and what your guidelines or recommendations are? Well, again, just what you said is what I'm going to be teaching in this new book. We've associated, especially in my era, running with fitness. And we now know, and I'm sure you've seen some of the studies, especially excessive running is chronic. We now have seen the studies on what it does to, especially marathons, on to enzymes and blood work and blood clotting. There are a lot of downsides. Now, well-trained runners can get away with it, but there's always some damage done to the heart. There's many studies out there right now. And in fact, there's some new protocols I've been just reading on even uh, cardiac rehab protocols that are going to weightlifting as opposed to the running type activity because the slow intensity, again, walk doesn't challenge the heart. It's called your heart reserve. So what we really want to do in the real world is challenge the heart like we would in real work. If you and I grab a chair and go up the stairs, all of a sudden there's a change in demand on the heart, up and down, up and down. And this low intensity walk that we've been taught for the last five decades doesn't challenge that heart in that way. So all, all the best runners I work with cross train with weight training. And I like three Ks, five Ks, no more than 10 Ks. The body responds, what I teach my clients, the body responds well to acute stress, not so well to chronic stress. It's just the same with the disease. Anything chronic, we now know long distance running is very oxidative on the body. Running for women more than men, they have six to 10 times the issues, as you know, because of what's called the Q angle, which is the hip with them, more women are wider than men and it causes problems at the knees, the hips, ankles. A lot of women don't like to hear that, but it's very hard on the joints of the body. Um, but the way most people I see run, it's more of a shuffle. And the problem with that, the most fundamental movement I teach is the squat. And I'm not talking about squat with weight on. I'm talking about a potty squat to be able to squat down in the chair, squat down on the toilet and get up. The shuffle most people do doesn't strengthen the hip muscles, the big muscles, the glutes, the hamstrings, the adductors, because it's a shuffle. So it's very deceiving thinking that you're fit when you do a run, and they're not strengthening these muscles around the hip. So you, men you mentioned squats. I love that. I think that the body squat, that gives people a real visualization not, um, of exactly the type of squat, but also, I mean, that's activities of daily living. We really want not just quantity of life we want quality of life i had heard a study one time maybe you're aware of it said there was something to do with how quickly you could get up off the floor was a predictor of longevity well getting up off the floor goes along with that squat how many people that are elderly have no upper body strength so if they have no upper body strength they do fall how are they going to get up or get now they have the of course alert monitors which is fine but it's quality of life the walk doesn't challenge the upper body. This is why we have shoulder issues, rotator cuff. I have plenty of women that, women and men, I've had a recent that went out in the yard, grabbed something on the tree, tore a rotator cuff. So that walk around the block and the treadmill doesn't do it. And this is why we're having a greater incidence of shoulder replacements, knee replacement. They're doing nothing to strengthen the integrity of the joints. And this walking, this running is way off base. In this new book, I'm gonna really identify all the problems, present studies, as you said, that it's going to blow people away that we've gotten the wrong message from our government. There are studies out there showing that the slow intensity walk, but you're not going to hear about that because the health clubs all promote, come on in, jump on the treadmills and walk. The best way to use the treadmills and the bikes is to do what is called interval training, which most people have heard about it, yeah. but they may not you know, understand it completely. But that means short bouts of intense activity and recovery. It could be even a five second push real hard on the bike, uphill on the treadmill and bring it down. The studies have shown just 15 minutes a couple of times a week, better improvement in cardiovascular, VO2, doing that than this low intensity walk. This is why people are frustrated. So making the point on that though, I always make the point, once people understand if the goal is to lose weight, once they understand 
that it all has to do with the diet, they can put exercise in perspective. They don't have to be in the gym four or five days a week. Now they're more likely, that improves compliance is what I always say. If they know the science behind my two workouts a week, this is big besides all the health benefits that you're talking about, pumping the heart, heart reserve, of the arteries are more, are, are more pliable when we pump the heart through weight training, the strength we get from it, uh, mobility of the joints, flexibility through weight training properly through a full range of motion. Big benefits of weight training, which is what I teach as a base over what all trainers today teach, which is endurance and stamina. Right, right. I think that you're right. It takes some of the stress off of those that feel like, well, in order to lose weight, I really need to put in this many hours of day and maybe or week. And maybe that's also why some people fail because they feel like it's not, it's not really feasible to it's take five really or six hours away from your family, your job and, and keep that up. Yeah, the time constraints are, are too big for most people. So once they understand the science behind weight training, how good it is, we'll get away from all that excessive running. And again, those that like to run a little bit is fine, but there's just too much evidence on the contrary on the downside of it on the heart, oxidative stress to the body. For women, again, more than men, hip, knee, ankle problems. Most people get out in the heat and I see them shuffling. And they're miserable. I'm not going to start an overweight person out like that. I'm going to start out as a base of strength. They can do these strength exercises at home. And once they understand, again, the post-metabolic burn from it, they don't have to spend all this time in the gym. You can't compensate for the bad eating habits with exercise unless you've got three or four hours a day like an athlete. Oh, I love that. You can't compensate for your daily bad eating habits. Yep, yep I totally agree. Um, very good point. Let's dive into a typical workout for you. You encourage people to do two days. What does that consist of? So what I do different and makes a big difference for the very deconditioned market, this new obese market, we call it. They're going into the gym, a lot of trainers, and because they're selling these 30-minute sessions, this is why they're driving back out, they don't spend time on a thorough warm-up. In my system, I have a, I call it a dy dynamic, strategically sequenced warm-up, which takes only 10 to 12 minutes. But because we're doing only two workouts, we're doing total body workouts. So because we're only doing two body, total body workouts, we have to warm up the whole body. Now that warm-up is strategic. I do two pushing movements, two pulling movements, so that we can work the shoulders in different planes, warm up the joints dynamically, and I have a very strategic warm-up for the core, especially for overweight people. They love it because they can do it standing up. This is a problem. When you bring people that are out of shape and they're uncomfortable with exercise, as we do in all the big clubs today, they're embarrassing people and they don't know it because the trainers are all young and they don't understand the psychological side of exercise for these people. So they're bringing them in and frightening them. They put them on the floor, very uncomfortable movements. You know, they, I see people and they're very uncomfortable with these movements. They're putting them on unstable exercises. They're starting them out with this new stuff they see on YouTube with the straps. People are frightened of exercises where they're very unstable. So I start all my new clients in very safe, stabilized positions on the machines. Now this is the controversy between the free weights and machines and functional fitness, but you've got to start somewhere. If I can get them on the machines, get them comfortable where they're safe, and I can stimulate the largest muscles. And what that means again, I can get them on a chest press machine. I can get them on a pulling machine safe. The biggest muscles of the body are the legs, the back, and the chest. And I can push as heavy as they can handle for a couple sets after I warm them up thoroughly. Plus I'm giving them a couple minutes rest between sets so they can build a tolerance for exercise. And once they start feeling good about themselves, not only that, I'm strengthening the joints so they have more in the mobility of the joint. I can transition them slowly to some free weight exercises that can help them the rest of their life. Now, the one movement I start right away is a potty squat. Mm -hmm. Now, most clients, most people in America, believe it or not, they can't even squat down a little without their knees hurting. And the reason why, of course, they're carrying too much weight, they have no integrity of the joint. So if there's a little bit of play in the joint, that extra weight and trying to exercise is causing pain in the joint. So I start out with a very small potty squat, graduating to a little bit, a little bit deeper. Most people, most trainers will get them walking right away. And if they're overweight, no stability of the joint, even a walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes can be terrible on the joints. They're not building any muscle. It's boring to death. 
and they're misled thinking they're going to lose weight doing 30 minutes on a treadmill or 45 minutes. It doesn't burn that many calories. The studies show, I mean, if you spend an hour walking, the equivalent of two slices of bread. I'd rather eliminate the two slices of bread than be bored on there and not get the benefit of weight training. So I start strategically, what you were asking me, with a base of strength so I can slow things down. I do nothing that's athletic or skillful. That's driving people out of the gym. I do nothing that's embarrassing or awkward. And I see this all the time in the gym. People see that and I've heard about that. Like in The Biggest Loser, that keeps them from even going into the gym. They're frightened. I also don't, I do some psychological thing. When they come in the gym, I don't weigh them that first month. I don't measure them. This is keeping people out of the gym. And the gym owners won't listen to me. I said, these people already know they're overweight. You don't have to tell them that. The first most important thing we can do for people is develop a rapport, help them out, get them started. If they can't stick with the program, if there's no, they can't even stick to two exercises a week, then there's no need to do all these evaluations other than a basic, as you know, I'm going to see what they're on, on meds. I'm going to ask if there's any limitations or injuries, of course. But I bring them then, develop a rapport and start them out very simply and transition slowly with weight training as a base because it's more comfortable. Right. The two things that I took from that that I think are so powerful, Rick, is that you said that exercise needs to be safe. I love how you explain that. That really makes a lot of sense to me. And I love that you said there's a psychological aspect of exercise. We want people to not only be able to exercise, but then make it a part of their daily, weekly, monthly, yearly habits, not just something they do January 1st through when they're sick of it on the 20th. So it's got to be simple. And I try to tell trainers all the time, the ones that listen to me, your most important goal in the beginning is develop this simple base program that they'll stick to the rest of life. Now, after that, if they want to expand and transition people, they start to like exercise, which some of my clients do, and do other things, become more athletic, that's fine. But you want to give them something that they can use that's simple, that they can replicate easy. And a lot of what I see in the gym is fancy stuff they've seen on YouTube, even stuff like you've seen these heavy ropes and the, the straps that they will never do on their own, I guarantee, back in the gym. They may do it with a trainer, then they leave and they never follow up. So you have to have a base of simplicity. And our body simply works in four movements, pushing, pulling, squatting, and I call rotation movements for the core. Very good. That brings me to a question about those people that are in pain. I like that you said you move slow, you keep it safe. But what about the people that are thinking, that are listening, thinking, I'm really in a lot of pain and it's very hard to want to even go to the gym or mm -hmm. start? Uh, two things. One thing you brought up to me when we talked in the past, uh, energy-wise, people say, I have no energy to work out. And that was a good question. I said, well, you have no energy because you haven't challenged your energy systems, as you know. So the only way you're going to get them in the gym and stick with it is to start low on the energy systems again. This is why the base of weight training works so well. I can start low with the energy systems, make it comfortable. Now, most people have pain, as you said, because they are out of shape. They have laxity in their joints, so they have no strength. The, the muscles, remember, which you know, cross the joint and help stabilize the joints, the same as our ligaments do, binding bone to bone. So as I warm those muscles up and stabilize the joints, and I'll start with small ranges of motion, it, I am blown away, Heather, this last 10 years that I've been documenting these results from this program. Uh, knee problems go away in weeks. Uh, shoulder problems because I stabilize them. But the key is starting very slow, uh, finding out what does bother them. I can work around an injury in the shoulder because that's the nice thing about a gym. I still recommend a gym because of the variety of equipment. I can work the shoulder in different planes in the beginning, work around a joint for people that understand the joint, have some background in physiology, and we can work around that pain. But that's why strength training, I think, is more important than getting on that treadmill, pounding the joints when you're overweight, does nothing for the upper body, and they're not going to get anything out of it, and they're still going to be in pain. Absolutely. So what you're saying is that really all workouts can be adapted to each person's individual situation and, and or limitations. Yes. And I think the base of weight training starts them out better than the walk because it doesn't address the joints and the pain you're talking about in different areas. And people just need to really get started.
they just got to get started, but they need to find the right trainer. Or again, I'm, I'm hoping to get this book out in the next few months and it's really going to give them a guideline. It'll explain simply. And I'm even thinking about putting a video in with the book of my warm up because it's a strategically sequenced dynamic warm up. Now remember this, I'll make this point because a lot of people still may be old school. This is new. A lot of trainers still go in, a lot of athletes. You know what a static stretch is. I know well, that's where we hold a stretch. We've been told for five decades. And then the muscle relaxes, and then we take a little further. You never, never, never want to do static stretching before exercising. For one thing, the muscle relaxes, so now there's no stability of the joint. Think of it. That's why they tell you that. When we do a dynamic warm-up, which is simply moving, if I do a bicep curl with a light weight, that's dynamic instead of just stretching. That puts a little bit of tension on the muscle, will help stabilize the joints that the muscle crosses. Much more effective warm-up much better for stabilizing the joint. So I do a strategically sequenced dynamic warm-up, and that makes all the difference in the workout for most people. That alone, the fact that warm-up is the workout for many people in the beginning, start them out slow, as you said. Right, boy, I think a video of that would be awesome, awesome to watch somebody do it. Your website really has a lot of information, and one of the things that you're doing for all of the listeners today is you have a free gift for them. Can you explain that? Uh, they're going to be able to go on, go to my website. I've given you a form. Uh, instead of signing up, you'll get a month free to see all these videos that I've made in my strategically sequenced dynamic warm-up. It's so simple. Remember, I have a saying, simplicity simply works. The workout doesn't have to be these crazy things you see on TV. It should be simple. Learn to push, pull. And my core workouts on there, which is standing up with a ball, doing rotations, and simple bend over exercises dynamically, but then I really go to the big medicine ball. Most people put you on the ball and just say, just do it like a mechanic. But I explain the benefits of getting on the ball and relaxing in a flex position and lying on the ball backwards in an extended. We rarely get to do that. We sleep all night long parallel. The ball gives us the benefit, and this is big time for most people as we get older, of creating mobility in the spine. And when we have a mobile, nice moving spine, the uh, nerves stay centered in that spinal column. We don't. We have less impingement. We move better. We feel better. The golfers and tennis players are going to play better because of greater mobility. So I explain the science behind what they're getting out of these simple exercises that they don't have to go to these fancy exercises to gain benefit of exercise. I think that's huge to really understand the why behind it is so yeah. empowering. And I like that you said simplicity simply works. You work the plan. The plan is going to work. There's not, this isn't, you make, you're not making this up. There's science and there's real facts behind this. And people yeah. can really rest assured that they're on the right track following these programs. So, so remember, uh, that's another point since you reminded me that I'm writing in this book too. It's not the program that is so important. It's the effort behind it. What I mean by that is I see a lot of people, they look at all these different programs on YouTube and the TV. And I see them in the gym and they got this piece of paper and they set it on the floor and I watch them, oh, I did 10 of these, I did 10 of that. It's not the program, it's the quality of the workout, doing one set and challenging the body. If you don't challenge the body, there's no results. You can't just go in the gym and do a lot of light stuff like the trainers do. You might be breathing hard, but that's just because you're out of shape. So it's the quality of the workout that's most important. Boy, great, great point. I hate to say that we have to start to wrap this up. I think I could spend a lot more time with you. You're really a wealth of information. It's been fun to hang out. Uh, before we go, though, I just have a couple of fun questions. I've been asking all the experts that if I came into your kitchen and opened up your refrigerator, what would be two things that I would always find in your refrigerator? Always find, and I give the bottle to all my clients as I drink and hydrate first thing in the morning with I like coconut almond milk. The almond milk's too gritty for me. I love coconut milk. People don't realize you need to hydrate first thing in the morning. And the, oh, the coconut milk is monounsaturated fatty acids. So that gives you energy if you only drink that alone without the insulin spike. People gotta understand the insulin spike. But what else? You're gonna always find eggs in there. Big myth about eggs, you know, I eat whole eggs, one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can have. You can eat hard boiled eggs in. If you don't have food in the house, you scramble a couple of eggs, put a little cheddar cheese for people that don't have allergies to cheese, of course, and that, and you've got a great little meal. So eggs, coconut milk, and I do drink a lot of kefir. I like kefir, it's a, for those that don't know, it's a uh, it's pasteurized before it's fermented. It's a fermented product, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Probiotics are so important for the gut. Most of our health begins in the gut. 
probiotics are important for the stomach. Very good. So if my, my last question would be, if you're stuck on a desert island, what would be two products you would take? Would probiotics be one of those two products or supplements? I'll tell you what, kefir be, would be one of my favorites. Kefir is a source of protein and probiotics. And, and if you had a little bit of sugar, some of them had a little cane sugar, you've got a meal replacement or a protein drink that's better than all these protein drinks you can buy at the gyms that are loaded with sugar and junk in them. So kefir would be something I would, I would take to the island. I like that question. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for being a part of this summit. I really appreciate the time that you've put into thank it. For having um, and the work that you're doing for this community. I encourage all the listeners to reach out for you and take advantage of your free membership for a month on your website, boy, they will not be disappointed. You give them my email if you'd like to too. I will. I'll, I'll answer them if they send me a question. I will, very generous of you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to our listeners. It's been another great episode of the Take Your Life Back Summit. We are dedicated to bringing you information to help you feel hope, find answers, ultimately start healing. Make sure to look in your inbox tomorrow morning because you're not going to want to miss the next expert on the summit. Thanks again. This is Dr. Heather Yost. Take care, be well, and we'll see you tomorrow.